So, uh, I don't know, maybe some of you have uh, seen it, but we're just gonna change it. And um, so this is about approach to a patient with visual loss, so, um, which is not an uncommon situation if you are a neurologist. So uh, if someone presents with loss of vision, uh, you know, the first step is history, taking history. And when you take the history, you want to determine if this is uh, unilateral or bilateral. So is it one eye, is it monocular or binocular? And this is important in the differential diagnosis as we will see later on, okay? So you, you're gonna ask your usual questions about the onset, acute, is it acute, is it subacute, is it chronic? And whether the visual loss is transient or is it persistent, constant, or is it progressively getting worse? And you know, and depending on how you review the systems and your differential diagnosis, you wanna uh, ask about associated symptoms such as headache, uh, neurological symptoms, et cetera. Okay, so this is probably one step where uh, is often omitted uh, uh, by neurologists is taking visual acuity. So in the um, I mean the eye clinic, the eye clinic for ophthalmologists, we have a there's a visual chart, a vision chart, and uh, you can obtain snell and visual acuity. But if you don't have that, you can just use a near vision card, which is available as a card or as uh, on your phone, mobile phone. And this is pretty accurate for determining visual acuity and it helps um, in determining whether this patient truly has a uh, visual loss. So the Snell visual acuity can be obtained either by a chart projected under the wall or the screen or from a near visual card. Um, the thing about visual acuity is that sometimes you take visual acuity and the cause of the uh, uh, decreased visual acuity, it's, uh, it's not neurological, it's refractive. So the patient may have astigmatism, he may not, may not have his glasses with him at the time, or he has carotid conus or uh, cataract or other things. So what you do is you do, um, if you don't have uh, access to refraction, uh, you, you get uh, you, what you do is you do a uh, pinhole visual acuity. So you basically take, you see the picture on the left, you see the occluder with pinholes. So the pinhole really eliminates any refractive error and thus uh, obtain the best corrected visual acuity. So if you do that, you know, the, the visual acuity decrease is not neurological, it's probably refractive, et cetera. Okay. But in the eye clinic, we do a refraction using the phoropter, which is on the, the screen, on the picture on the screen on the right. So this is just an overview of the evaluation of how you assess a patient with visual loss. So first you go by history. And you, you, as we said, you determine if this is monocular or binocular, is it transient or persistent? And you ask about associated symptom. And in the examination, you basically assess the afferent and the efferent visual symptoms. For the afferent visual system, you assess visual acuity, color, fields, and you look at the fundus, the retina, and the optic nerve. And the efferent part, you examine the eye movement, and the stagmus, pupil, eyelids, etc. Uh, color vision testing is very helpful, especially if you suspect a patient who has uh, optic nerve or macular disease. So uh, the most common way to assess color vision is using the uh, Ishihara or the pseudo-isochromatic color plates, which is the book on the left side. And this is really good for determining, uh, assessing patient with acquired uh, color vision loss uh, along the red-green axis, but there are other more sophisticated ways of assessing color vision, such as the HHR, HRR plates or the Fansworth uh, Munzel D15 panel, which is the picture on the right side. But for more practical purposes, the Ishihara uh, color plates are adequate. 
So uh, uh, color vision loss with visual loss can be due to optic nerve or macular disease. As we said, the Ishihara color plates uh, is very good for assessing uh, acquired and congenital color deficiency, especially in males, because 8% of males will have uh, color, uh, color blindness along the red-green axis. And the other thing that's really important when you're assessing uh, vision loss in a patient is testing the pupil. And what you want to really look for is look for a relative afferent pupillary defect. And this is truly one of the uh, objective signs uh, in ophthalmology because everything else we do is based on asking the patient. So we ask the patient if the patient can see, uh, we put a we use a book, we, we tell them to read the letters on the screen, but um, this is not truly objective. The uh, relative affability defect is an objective sign, so it's like a heart murmur or it's like a knee jerk. It's something that you can do and you can observe and evaluate yourself. And the way to do it is, as you know, doing the, the swinging flashlight test. So what you do is you... Uh, the way I teach residents to do it, a medical student, is to have the patient sit in a very dark room and use a high intensity light. And you do a swinging flash test. So you do the rhythmic alternating movement and uh, you observe how the pupil uh, reacts. And what you want to really look for is an RAPD. So what if the pupil, let's say one of the pupils is dilated and, one, and you suspect that the patient has uh, optic neuropathy in that eye that, that with the dilated pupil, what would you do then? What would you, how would you assess if the patient has a relative afferent pupillary defect? Anyone can answer? Hello? Hello? Yeah, we can hear you, Tom, with you. I, I just want to make sure you're not sleeping, huh? I don't so, know. Yeah. No. So, um, so, so could you repeat the question, that, uh, The patient has... Um, has an RIPD in the right eye, and someone has dilated that eye with drops before he, you see him. What would you, what, how would you assess if he has a relative afferent pupillary defect? Um, so if the eyes are dilated, one, one eye. Would be, pardon? One eye is dilated. Let's okay. say right eye is dilated. And the patient complains of decreased vision in that eye, and you want to check if he has a relative afferent pupillary defect. So you're gonna do the swinging flashlight test, and yeah. if it's not constricting, and that means that the defect is in that eye, and usually the defect would be. So the, the pupil, that eye, the pupil is dilated. It's not going to move with, uh, the pupil is not going to react to light in yeah. that particular eye. So what would you do? What would you look for then? Um, we're going to be looking whether it's a first order neuron or a second order neuron or no, third. Testing, what would you look for? The test while, while you're testing the patient. Or would you be observing? You're gonna look at the other eyes, huh? Yeah. Yeah, so you shine the light in that eye and you look for the reaction of the pupil in the other eye because they have a direct and an indirect response, right? Yeah, yeah. So even if that pupil is dilated, you can still detect RAPD in that eye that is dilated by observing the other pupil. Yeah. So, uh, this, is, this is called reverse, I mean, it's strongly called reverse RAPD because uh, if the pupil is dilated or, for example, if the patient had trauma or surgery and the pupil doesn't react to light, 
uh, but it's it's truly a direct RAPD because you are uh, stimulating uh, pupil of that particular eye. So even if you have one eye which is in, the, in which the pupil is not working, you can still uh, detect RAPD if the other pupil is in, intact. Is that understood clear? Yep. Okay. All right, and, and from this evaluation, so um, you use the direct thalmoscope and uh, I, one area where most residents, a neurology resident or medical student will have difficulty with is that um, they use the direct thalmoscope and the, uh, for example, the pupil is not dilated and there is no reason why you should not dilate uh, the pupil in a patient, except uh, let's say the patient is in a neurosurgical ICU and they want to observe the pupil or has has head trauma, or whatever. But you can really use the eye the dilating eye drops for on any patient, and this will just make uh, endoscopy much easier. Now in this in these times, the corona times, and uh, you know uh, it's probably not a good idea to do endoscopy. Uh, for patients because what you need to do is you need to be really close enough to the patient's eye in order to get the uh, maximum uh, visual field basically basically you want to see as much of the retina and the optic nerve as possible so in normal times the let's say the mistake that most residents do is that they are not close enough to the patient when we, you know, they're doing endoscopy so um, um, you want to look at the nerve, optic nerve, and you want to look at the macula. And you can also, if the patient's dilated, you can look at the uh, mid-periphery uh, of the retina for any changes such as hemorrhages, um, hypertensive changes, or diabetic retinopathy, et cetera. Uh, the other uh, important uh, component of the assessment is the visual field testing. And you can test visual fields on the, on the patient bedside using um, finger counting by uh, confrontation. But in the eye clinic, uh, we do formal visual field assessment using automated perimetry. And this is just uh, the printout, the uh, typical printout of visual field testing. So on the upper, uh, can you all see my cursor moving, or you, you can't? Yeah, we can. Okay, so this here, this is the uh, visual indices. This tells you if the visual field is reliable or not. So you can see things like false negatives, uh, uh, false positive percentage. If the patient was truly fixating on a target while, while he was being tested and not looking around everywhere. And this is uh, called the grayscale, which is just uh, a visual uh, representation of the visual field defect. Uh, this is called the, uh, uh, the total deviation, which is basically comparison uh, between this patient and his age matched uh, uh, controls for any defect. And this is the, to uh, the pattern deviation, which is basically looking at any localized uh, visual field defect. And this is probably along with the grayscale, the pattern deviation and the grayscale is the most helpful thing for you as a neurologist because you really want to see localized uh, defect. You don't want to see like uh, uh, things that are, for example, due to cataract or refractive error, which can manifest in the total deviation. You want to look at localized defects. Uh, that will help you into uh, that will help you to localize where the uh, lesion is. And I'm sure you have seen this picture before uh, in your textbook. It's it just shows you the loc location of the lesion along with the corresponding visual field defect. And as a rule, anything that's anterior to the chiasm is unilateral. Uh, it's either optic nerve or retina, chiasm usually lesions are bitemporal, and anything posterior to the chiasm is homonymous. And the homonymous uh, 
homonymous visual field defect can vary in their congruity, that means similarity, according to their, their location. But really, uh, you cannot just tell by how congruous or incongruous the visual field defects in a homonymous visual field defect. You cannot really localize accurately the location of the lesion. You can only say that this t lesion is retrochiasmal and you do imaging and radiolog radiological studies to help you localize where the lesion is. Now, there are other tests that uh, you can do. The photostress recovery test is basically, we do it in the eye clinic, how the patients sit and on the slit lamp by a microscope and we project a bright light onto, into the macula uh, for about 15 to 20 seconds. And then we test the visual acuity before and after that test. Normally, the visual acuity should not drop by more than two lines if you do the uh, photo stress recovery test. If it drops more than that, then this would indicate a macular disease rather than an optic nerve disease. And we have IVFA, fluorescein. We have OCT, uh, which is becoming really important in neurology. And we're going to talk about that. And we have ERG, which is the uh, electroretinogram. So these are the, one of the a few of the things that you can do in order to uh, try to differentiate whether this lesion is retina or, or optic nerve. So we're going to talk about transient visual loss because this is really a common complaint. And as we said earlier, you can uh, ask in the history about whether this is monocular or binocular. Um, and the examination in, in most of these cases is often normal. So the history is really probably the most important uh, aspect of the evaluation in order to determine what the uh, diagnosis is. So there are ocular versus non-ocular uh, causes of uh, transient loss of vision and the pathophysiology is usually ischemic uh, however, they could be non-ischemic and they could be migraine, as you know. <clears throat> so the non-ischemic causes is usually if the patient complains, let's say, of transient visual loss, and he would tell you that if he blinks, for example, and the visual, the visual loss would go away. Um, uh, and sometimes uh, the visual loss is not complete loss of vision. It's, it's basically just blur or fogging of the vision. And um, this could be, for example, seen in dry eyes, a uh, patient who have angle closure glaucoma, if they have pain associated with it. But the ischemic ones tend to be sudden, sudden onset, and they tend to recover slowly in the central or peripheral visual field. And the defects, uh, or the, the defect, the visual field defects tend to respond either the vertical or the horizontal meridian. So uh, the patient would tell you that I see, for example, a black curtain coming from down up to, let's say, half of my visual field or is coming from the right or left side and stopping right in the middle. And um, you need, of course, in the history to ask about symptoms such as headache, jaw claudication, pain and other neurological signs. So you all have seen patients with migraine and you know that patients with migraine can have a visual aura, uh, usually before the onset of migraine. So how would you tell if the patient has a migraine? The migraine attacks tend to be uh, stereotypes. The patient often uh, are young and they can have uh, positive visual symptoms such as scintillating lights and, and flashes and et cetera, with other autonomic symptoms such as nausea and, and vomiting. Uh, they are always binocular. However, the patient may tell you that they only notice, notice it in the eye that has the temporal field changes only. So the patient can be mistaken and to, uh, can lead you erroneously in the history to this being an, a monocular phenomenon while it's truly a binocular phenomenon. Uh, so the, you can have these uh, uh, visual aura 
symptoms such as the scintillating, pa scintillating patterns and color light. And uh, sometimes they're followed by headache, but uh, many times it's not followed by headache and acephalgic migraine. And of course, when you need to take further history, you, you, you discover that this patient had had these attacks before and they can be precipita precipitated or triggered by some kind of trigger such as stress, uh, hunger, and or certain kind of food. And this is just a picture of, um, you know, visual representation of the types of uh, visual aura positive uh, symptoms that you would see in, in migraine patients. So here, this is a mostly it's like a scintillating light and it tends to grow and spread and move, march across the visual field. Sometimes it's uh, fogging and sometimes you can see different other uh, visual patterns as well. Now, what, other, what are the other things that can cause uh, transient loss of vision. Uh, you, you all have seen patients who have, uh, for example, multiple sclerosis or MS, and they complain of transient loss of vision or generally fluctuation in one eye or both eyes, and typically in the eye that had previous history of optic neuritis. Uh, so these things can uh, increase with the changes in the body temperature, with, with exercise or having a hot shower. Um, the other thing about, uh, the other uh, thing that can cause transient visual loss for a few seconds is transient visual obscurations in patients with papilledema. So these patients would tell you that if they bend down or if they change their body posture, they get blackout of vision that lasts for about 10 seconds and would go away. Now, occasionally, uh, you can get uh, something that's called gaze evoke amaurosis, which is basically uh, when the patient looks in one direction, uh, they, they would experience transient loss of vision because of the presence of an orbital mass or a tumor that is compressing the uh, optic nerve or uh, impeding circulation of the optic nerve with the change of uh, uh, the eye position and eye movement. And this is common in patients who have benign lesions of the orbit, uh, such as cavernous hemangiomas, for example, or even patients with optic nerve sheath meningiomas. Uh, you want to look at the optic disc. Uh, can anybody tell me what they see in this uh, uh, fundus picture of the optic nerve? Anyone? So um, this is the fundus of. So these are two different pictures, right? Oh yeah. Um, I was left, looking at the, the left, left one. Is by uh, slit lamp, so that's why it's not clear. But you can appreciate what is uh, what's going. Maybe, and the one on the right is is a different uh, patient. So. So. The one um, on the right, the um, there seems to be some kind of uh, attenuated margins of the um, retina. Sorry. Um, It's as if there's actually a bleed going on around it. Which one, the right one? Yeah. Okay, what about the left one? It, the margins are completely gone and It's as if it's submerged with the surroundings. Mm -hmm. 
So uh, how would you describe this nerve on the left? Is it swollen or is it normal? Is it pale? No, the one on the left is actually pale. Is it swollen or is it not swollen? Swollen. Okay, what about the one on the right? Um, the one on the right? Yeah, it's swollen as well, but it's, it's oh. not as pale as yeah. the previous so who, one. Who would, uh, anybody else? Uh, anybody? So, I mean, what, what I was trying to show you is when you look at the, at the disc, so this is a swollen optic nerve, right? So this is uh, some, uh, probably papilledema. This is, is not a, is this not a swollen optic nerve. This is a patient with, uh, you can see these yellowish refractile bodies and the sort of the uh, irregular uh, margin sort of the punched out margin of the uh, optic nerve. This is the disc drusen, okay? And this is, can be confused with disc swelling, right? Uh, I'm just showing these two pictures because both of these things can give you a transient loss of vision. So if you have papilledema, the patient can experience uh, transient visual obscurations, as we've just said. And then if you have disc drusen, also the patient can experience either monocular or if it's in both eyes, a binocular uh, transient loss of vision. Uh, and so when you assess the patient, when you look at the fundus, it's really important for you to differentiate true disc swelling from false disc swelling. So you wanna differentiate, let's say, papilledema from pseudopapilledema, right? So this one on the left is true papilledema. This is pseudopapilledema. Okay. okay. All right. So uh, for the uh, ischemic causes of uh, transient loss of vision, um, so the ischemia can occur at the level of the retina, the optic nerve, or the visual pathways, right? And um, so this would give you a monocular. So by visual pathways, we mean anything anterior to the chiasm, right? Whereas cortical uh, ischemia would give you binocular loss of vision. And the, the cause is, as you know, often is due to uh, carotid artery disease. Uh, the risk of stroke from carotid artery uh, TBL is, uh, uh, is for, sorry, from a retinal uh, TBL is much lower than an hemispheric TBL. So the, if you have a monocular TBL due to retinal ischemia, uh, there is a risk of stroke, but it's much less than, let's say, hemispheric uh, transient ischemic attack. So what is the typical pattern of ischemic uh, TBL? It's abrupt, it's painless. It can last from anywhere from one to uh, up to 10 minutes. It respects the vertical or the horizontal meridian and it resolves over a few minutes. So when you're taking the history, uh, and because it's sometimes really difficult for the patient to, to know if this was binocular or binocular, they don't remember or they did not cover their eye while they were experiencing it, what is helpful to, for you is to ask the patient, let's say if he was able to read, if he was able to watch TV, if he was able to continue to drive his car at the, at the time while he was experiencing uh, this phenomenon. So if, if this was a monocular uh, phenomenon, normally the patient would still be able to continue to carry on these activities. If this was binocular, then the patient would be more symptomatic and he would tell you that he was unable to read or if he was driving, he had to stop uh, driving the car, park the car, until it uh, went away. So this is one uh, sort of tip in the history. You can ask the patient uh, 
this question to differentiate monocular from binocular TBL. And of course, you can always ask about um, associated neurological symptoms. If this was if the patient had hemiparesis, hemisensory loss, or hemianopia, that means the, an ischemia in the middle cerebral artery territory. A vertical ataxia and diplopia would point out to uh, posterior circulation or more into the vertebrobasilar distribution. And also, always remember uh, giant cell arteritis. Always ask about pain gel claudication because giant cell arteritis is one of those things that can present with transient uh, loss of vision. Okay, so the other thing about uh, ischemic, uh, retinal ischemic transient visual loss is that the patient, when, they, when he's exposed to bright light, uh, he would experience this transient monocular uh, blindness. So this is called bright light induced amaurosis. Uh, typically, the, the cause is impaired retinal uh, circulation to the outer retina. And the other thing, uh, one, uh, gonna, one thing that you can do as well is look in the fundus of those patients and you look for uh, plaques. So you can dilate the patient and you look at the, uh, uh, the retinal arterioles and sometimes you would see cholesterol or fibrin plaques. And this, patient, this would tell you that this patient had uh, an embolus in the retina. Ocular ischemic syndrome is when you have uh, severe ocular ischemia from carotid artery disease that would uh, impair the circulation to the, to the whole eye itself, right? So uh, when you examine those patients, they can get um, something called venous stasis retinopathy. So they tend to get a lot of hemorrhages in the mid periphery of the retina and the disc uh, swelling in the late stages. Um, so we talked a bit about drusen and how drusen can cause transient loss of vision. And this is a very good example of a disc uh, drusen. So you can see the sort of the punched out irregular uh, uh, margin of the nerve and you can see those uh, yellowish refractile bodies along the, the, uh, the optic disc. And you could see here in, in true papilledema, the vessels, as they cross the uh, disc margin, they will, they'll be opacified. So the, the nerve fiber layer would be covering these vessels would be opacified. However, here the, the vessels look uh, sharply distinct. So this is one uh, thing that would uh, help you differentiate uh, disc edema from uh, pseudo disc edema. This is a patient with ocular ischemic syndrome. And uh, you can see that the patient has a lot of hemorrhages. Uh, they have, uh, they have uh, some in the, in the late stages, they can get uh, proliferative changes. That means formation of new blood vessels secondary to ischemia. And they can get also uh, 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 new vascularization of the iris sometimes, right? So when you look in the retina, uh, you, are, uh, you are looking for these uh, changes. So if the patient has transient uh, loss of vision, which you suspect they are, uh, uh, it is ischemic. So uh, you, I'm done, I don't need to say that. You probably uh, know what kind of workup this patient needs. So you get Doppler, MRA, uh, you would get CTA and you would get cardiac echo to rule out uh, things like patent foramen or valley or cardiac vegetations or uh, some kind of valvular heart problem. Uh, you get a 24 hour EKG for uh, monitoring for arrhythmia. See, the patient has atrial fibrillations and he's uh, showering emboli uh, every now and then. And if you suspect an uh, Giant cell arteritis, you would obtain ESR and CRP. In young patients, yes, Hamid, you raise your hand? Yep, 
um, in the previous slide, yeah, in the previous slide, so um, the photo, the first photo, would you um, say that the patient um, has papilledema or would you just describe that the retina has um, yeah, swollen here, definitely. Yeah, it looks swollen, but I would not use the term papilledema because the papilledema is, uh, is a specific term denoting uh, discedema due to raised intracranial pressure. So you can, okay. say, you can say discedema or disc swelling, right? So okay. yeah, there is this swelling that you can see there's a, a this is called, this is a cotton wool spot here. Mm -hmm. So these are all ischemic uh, changes. One, one thing we used to do uh, at all times, something called a thermodynamometry. So we would have a, a machine that would, uh, would basically inflate and engage the pressure. And uh, those patients have a very low, and what you do is you raise the pressure, which is compressing the eye, and you watch the retinal circulation. And once, once you reach a level where the retinal circulation stop and you stop seeing pulsation of the central retinal artery, then um, um, if it's low, then this patient has an ocular ischemic syndrome. So you can do, for example, that if you're doing a thalmoscopy, you can sometimes push on the eye a bit uh, and, see, and see if you can uh, make the retinal artery stop pulsating, right? So okay. uh, dynamometry. Uh, yes, so in a young patient, you would, you would look for hypercoagulable condition uh, and you know, you, all, you know all these uh, conditions. So what would, you, what would you do for a patient who has uh, uh, transient loss of vision, whether it's retinal, monocular, or whether it's hemispheric, you, know, you, you, you would probably stop starting on aspirin. <clears throat> um, and uh, a non-surgical patient, you would probably give them warfarin or heparin. Uh, and as far as surgical treatment, uh, according to the NASCAT study, uh, the patient has three or more of the following uh, risk factors he would benefit from carotid and arterectomy. So uh, in a retinal TIA, let's say the patient has uh, monocular transient loss of vision and he has three or more of these risk factors, the risk of stroke is about 24%. And uh, you would probably consider doing um, endarterectomy for these patients. If the patient is more than 75 or is male, not make, it's a mistake here, uh, uh, has a history of intermittent claudication, or has carotid stenosis between 80 to 94%. So, as far as surgery, uh, and arterectomy complication rate for a major post-operative stroke was 2.1%. Uh, a uh, patient has stenosis of less than 70% with monocular or retinal T3PL, probably best managed medically, and uh, percutaneous transluminal angioplasty is, uh, can be used for poor surgical candidates. Uh, one of the things, one of the rare things that can give you uh, retinal ischemia with transient loss of vision is something called retinal vasospasm. And this is really something that's very rare and it's a diagnosis of ex exclusion. <clears throat> so these are typically young, healthy patients with repeated monocular uh, vision loss. And it has been associated with uh, exercise and in some instances cocaine use. And uh, calcium channel blockers uh, uh, can help in those patients to, for the vasospasm. And this is a very old uh, article, but it's probably worth checking again. It's just describing it. Uh, trend, treatment of vasospastic amaurosis fusec with calcium channel blockers. And there are pictures here that are showing even the vasospasm of the uh, uh, retinal arterioles. So, um, this is one of the things that the patient comes to you and 
he uh, he's describing if he if you happen to see him during the attack, you can probably look in the fundus and you would see the vasospasm of the retinal arterioles yourself. Never forget giant cell arteritis, right? Giant cell arteritis can present with uh, transient loss of vision, transient double vision, right? So always keep in the look for giant cell arteritis. Uh, another thing that you probably uh, may have seen is um, transient cortical blindness following contrast media injection. And uh, this is often uh, seen after the use of hyperosmolar iodinated contrast, typically for uh, uh, during cardiac catheterization, for example. So what happens is that uh, with the injection of these agents, there is a breakdown of the blood-brain barrier. And uh, the patient would experience uh, binocular uh, transient visual loss that would come back in about three days. Uh, patient with hypertension were found to be more at risk of this. Now, of course, if the patient has that, you would still do the whole workup. You would image the patient just to make sure they don't have a stroke. But this is one thing that, can, uh, that could happen uh, after the use of contrast agent, whether it's cerebral or coronary uh, angiography. And this is just uh, uh, MRI uh, showing the uh, flare hyperintensity, uh, the arrows here, the changes that occur with the use of these uh, contrast agent, the occipital lobe. And this is just a CT as well, showing uh, gyroform hyperattenuation, the short arrows here. So all these changes is because of the breakdown of the blood-brain barrier after the use of this agent. Uh, another thing that would give you uh, binocular transient uh, loss of vision is a press, right? Posterior reversible encephalopathy syndrome. Now, many of those patients, are, they, they experience other symptoms at the time. They, have, they can have headaches, seizures, they can be encephalopathic, but visual disturbances is, uh, is uh, uh, an important feature. And this is often seen in hyper, severe hypertension, malignant hypertension, preeclampsia, or with the use of uh, certain drugs. Uh, such as uh, immunosuppressive drugs, such as cyclosporin or tac tacrolimus. And what, would you see, what you see in the MRI of this patient is uh, T2 hyperintensity, uh, many times in the parietal occipital region. And if you look at DWI, sometimes it can be uh, hyperintense, but this is due to the uh, edema, the T, what is being described as the T2 shine through. So what you do is you do the ADC that would show you the increased signal and that would, that would confirm that this is due to increased deviations due to uh, vasogenic edema, not cytotoxic edema that you would see with the uh, stroke, right? So press, posterior reversible encephalopathy syndrome. Uh, much rare... Uh, rarer cause of uh, transient binocular loss of vision is ep occipital lobe epilepsy. And this could be secondary to brain tumors or strokes even. And the origin of these uh, seizure attacks is usually the occipital or parietal occipital region or the temporal occipital region. Uh, occipital lobe epilepsy is, uh, can be seen in children. And sometimes they, could, they can experience a post-ictal visual loss, uh, much, much similar to what the Todd's paralysis that you see with, with the epilepsy, and it can la last for hours to two days. Okay, so um, I think we are, let's see how much, uh, Okay, so we, we can continue for a bit and then stop. Uh, so we've 
talked yeah. about transient loss of vision. We're going to talk about persistent uh, loss of vision. And the uh, persistent loss of vision, uh, like everything else in neurology, you want to localize where the problem is. So the problem can be in the eye, can be in the um, right, the the lens, it can be in the cornea, can be in the retina, the optic nerve. And as you proceed further backward, it can be due to the chiasm, visual pathway up to the occipital cortex. And many of the times, uh, a patient presents with loss of vision and the cause is not optic nerve, it's retinal problem. This is a young patient who had a sudden onset of uh, visual loss in his right eye. And uh, when you check his pupil reaction, he does not have an RAPD. So you basically ruled out uh, an optic neuropathy. And he does have some uh, reduced vision for color in that eye. But when you look in the eye, you can see this bullous elevation in the macula. It's like a bubble. I'm not sure if you can appreciate it, but it's demarcated here in the arrows. And when we do OCT, this black shadow, this uh, indicates fluid in the subretinal space. So this patient has central serous retinopathy, which is a common condition in young patients. And it's often been associated with young patients who have sort of, uh, un, uh, who are in stress or have the type A personality. And it's one of those things that can uh, be uh, confused with optic neuritis. But then, uh, like I said, you check the pupil, he does not have an uh, RAPD, and you look in the retina and you look at the macula and you look for uh, uh, the serous. Uh, elevation of the retina. So it's a serious detachment of the retina. Uh, patients with macular degeneration, um, such as cone dystrophy, can have progressive loss of vision with loss of color as well. And when you look in the uh, retina of the macula, you would see changes in the macula. This patient has a sort of you can see here in the macula and the fovea that you, you can't see the fovea reflex. And he, he has those pigmentary changes that sometimes we call it bull's eye maculopathy. So it's like a ring of hyperpigmentation uh, with the central area of hyperpigmentation as well. So it's just taking the shape of a bull's eye target. So this is a patient with cone dystrophy all right, and this is one of those things that probably can be confused with optic uh, neuropathy. Uh, there are so many drugs that can cause uh, retinal toxicity, one of which is uh, Plaquenil, hydroxychloroquine. Uh, Plaquenil is typically used for uh, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, and other neurological conditions. And depending on the dose and the duration of the drug, uh, the drug can cause toxicity to the macula, uh, the macula area. So this is the fundus picture, and this is the uh, fluorescein picture showing you the uh, central degenerative changes and the changes of macula in both eyes. Many of the times, the, uh, the problem can be structural in the retina. So this patient has uh, something called uh, a macular pucker, basically a, a growth of a membrane from the posterior hyaloid face, posterior vitreous on the retina. And this is cause, um, can cause puckering, it can cause uh, disorganization of the retinal surface and can cause uh, loss of visual acuity. And this is typically seen in diabetics and an older patient. And this is why OCT is, uh, is really helpful because it can show you, demonstrate these uh, changes. Sometimes it's even difficult to detect uh, with the fundus by microscopy. Uh, this is a macular hole. You can see that there's a hole here in the central macula. And this could be the consequences of uh, the previous slide, 
which is the uh, uh, surface wrinkling retinopathy. And this is typically seen in older patients, more common in women than, uh, than men. Uh, other things that can uh, sometimes uh, be confused with the uh, optic neuritis or, or papilledema is uh, this condition called uh, acute idiopathic blood spot uh, enlargement or MUDES. Uh, the other name is for it, or Azor. MUDES is multiple evanescent white dot syndrome. So these are typically younger patients, usually females. They present with photopsia. And uh, sometimes uh, they present with temporal loss of vision. And sometimes when you do visual field testing, you would see enlargement of the uh, blind spot. And when you examine those patients, you would see uh, those white spots in the peripapillary region. And you would sometimes see this, uh, this edema, right? Uh, so, um, Mild ischemia with deep white retinal spots. Um, ERG can be helpful in uh, di differentiating this condition from an optic neuropathy. So you can do a, a full field ERG and you would see uh, depressed A waves. And OCT also can show changes in the outer retinal layer. So OCT is also very helpful to differentiate this condition from optic uh, neuritis because this condition tends to resolve by itself and usually does not require treatment. Now, we are at the age of the era of uh, bariatric surgery, and uh, uh, we're seeing a lot of patients who are undergoing uh, bariatric surgery, and they're getting all kind of vitamin deficiency and malabsorption syndrome. And vitamin A deficiency, along with deficiencies in zinc, copper, vitamin B, uh, can present with uh, optic neuropathy and, and loss of vision. So always be uh, aware of that and ask the patient. If the patient presents with progressive loss of vision, you want to ask them if they had bariatric surgery recently or if they're using any of the vitamins which were recommended for them. Um, so uh, this is uh, something that we could have probably discussed when we were describing transient loss of vision, uh, transient loss of vision is retinal artery occlusion. So this is a fundus picture on the left of the patient with uh, central retinal artery occlusion. You can see here the opaque swollen retina with the chair red spot in the middle. And this is a patient with a branch retinal artery occlusion. You can see the uh, edema along the inferior sector of the uh, macula, and the arrows just indicate the uh, location of the plaques inside the retinal arterioles. So retinal artery occlusion is painless. It can be preceded by transient loss of vision, but you can also see that in uh, vasculitis, such as giant cell iritis or antiphospholipid uh, uh, syndrome. So, uh, you know, uh, retinal artery occlusion now is really treated uh, and managed just like stroke. Uh, we know that uh, the risk of stroke uh, sometimes can be as high as 24% on those patients who have uh, retinal artery occlusion. And so uh, when we see someone with retinal artery occlusion, we, we basically refer them to uh, the emergency room or stroke units, and we recommend MRI with DWI to, uh, uh, to look for strokes. And these patients really should be managed by a stroke team. Uh, there are numerous studies that show that uh, many of those patients can have, si have silent strokes at the time of the retinal artery uh, occlusion. And um, the, um, uh, they, most of these patients would be started on uh, anticoagulant and they needed uh, to be treated aggressively for other uh, risk factors as well. 
Uh, so this is one of the things that can cause uh, progressive loss of vision and the visual examination is, uh, sorry, the examination often is normal, is paraneoplastic retinopathy. So this is usually a bilateral, progressive loss of vision. Uh, the underlying tumors, most commonly small cell lung carcinoma or melanoma. And the target antigen in the retina is uh, 23 uh, kilodaltin protein recovery. But there are other uh, antigens also that have been uh, discovered and, and found out and being tested for. The ERG in this patient is uh, severely reduced, both the A waves and the B waves. So um, in someone who has, uh, let's say, older patient, has progressive loss of vision in, in both eyes, and you do the imaging, you do the MRI, you can't really find anything, and you, the, the, the examination is normal, you really need to suspect paraneoplastic uh, retinopathy on those patients. And uh, do the antibody testing, do the paraneoplastic panel testing, do the ERG, and you have to look for uh, underlying uh, tumors. Uh, optic neuropathy, the visual field defect in optic neuropathy is really not uh, specific for any kind of optic neuropathy. That means if you have a visual field defect, you can get that visual field de de defect in optic neuritis or ischemic optic neuropathy or compressive optic neuropathy, right? So this is just um, showing you the kind of visual de field defect that you can get with optic neuropathy. You can get, most commonly you would get a central uh, defect, but you can also get uh, inferior altitudinal or superior altitudinal, and you can get uh, arcuate defect. Here you can get seco uh, or secocentral, and here you can get uh, uh, this kind of visual field defect as well. So the most common cause of uh, optic neuropathy is uh, we see is the, other than glaucoma, of course, which is the most common optic neuropathy. Um, but the, we, we see non arteritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. So uh, NAION typically presents with painless loss of vision, uh, relative afferent pupillary defect, and you look and the fundus, and you see this disc swelling with the hemorrhages, right? Uh, it classically been taught that this occurs in patients who are above the age of 40, but you can see it in even younger patients. Uh, the disc edema can be sectoral or diffuse. And the, the other thing that's characteristic about those patients is they, that they have anomalous disc and they have very small cup to disc ratio, so-called disc at risk. So even if you see someone with an anterior ischemic optic neuropathy, look at the other eye, and if the other eye has a small cup to disc ratio, that sort of more confirms more that this patient has uh, NAION. And there are other, there are a variety of risk factors have been associated, the vascular risk factors with, with the NAION. The course tends to be static, but in 24, in 42% of cases, it can improve. Uh, in certain category patient, it can progress over several weeks, let's say 25%, and this is the, the so-called progressive ischemic optic neuropathy. And this is a patient who had an, uh, has an IO, NION and is probably seen in the later stages where he's developing a bit of atrophy here in the retina temporarily and you can see some residual hemorrhages uh, superiorly here and, and there as well. So this is just hemorrhage and it's just, this is also an anomalous disc because a disc with a small cup to disc ratio. And this is even later in the uh, state. So the, the disc is pale now and there, are, there is attenuation of the retinal arterioles. Uh, so 
non non arteritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy as opposed to arteritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy, which you see with giant sole arteritis. So here, the visual loss, the patients are older. The patient would have GCA symptoms, but not, not necessarily. They can only have visual symptoms, not systemic GCA symptoms. And the vision loss is often more severe. Uh, the disc swelling tends to be more pale. And then you could also see uh, retinal infarcts and cotton wool spots and the retina other than the optic nerve because GCA is a systemic vasculitis and it would affect different circulations of the retina, right? Um, we can do IV fluorescein and you can notice that there is delayed filling of the choroid in, uh, in GCA. And the other thing is that when you look, you can look at the other optic nerve, and if you notice that the optic nerve has a normal copti disc ratio, not disc as at risk as in non arteritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy, then uh, you would probably consider that this patient has arteritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy and you want to investigate more. So, this is a typical, uh, this is a picture of a patient who had. GCA, and you can see here on the left that this just looks more pale, right? And he's got a hemorrhage, but he also has a, a, a cotton wool spot here, so areas of ischemia in the retina, right? So the, the, uh, the, the blood supply to the optic nerve is not the same as the blood supply of the retina, right? Because we can have the uh, uh, the blood supply of the inner third, uh, uh, the inner inner third of the retina, is not the same as the outer two thirds of the retina. So, if you have a disease that is affecting more than one circulation in the eye and the retina, then you have to suspect uh, vasculitis, a systemic vasculitis, such as giant cell arteritis. And this is the uh, temporal artery biopsy of a patient with uh, giant cell arteritis. So you could see the, uh, the, uh, the changes at the level of the intima and the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the inflammation. And you can see a giant cell here as well. But you don't, you don't need to see a giant cell to call it giant cell arteritis. Uh, posterior ischemic optic neuropathy tends to occur uh, after severe blood loss. So the typical scenario is someone who had uh, hypotensive uh, shock or renal dialysis or a patient who had long surgical procedures such as spinal procedures or coronary bypass surgery. So typical, exact, typical history is story that the patient wakes up from surgery or from shock or from the I get it from the ICU and he noticed that he cannot see in one or both eyes. Um, so here, because the disc, because this is a posterior ischemic optic neuropathy, this, the discs are, us, are usually normal and you have to rely on the pupillary light, light reflex to, uh, to make the diagnosis. And sometimes you have to do imaging as well. So uh, this is someone with PION, posterior ischemic optic neuropathy. And you can see that it's got pallor in, in both, uh, both discs. So this changes would occur later on. It would not be seen uh, initially because optic atrophy would take about four to six weeks to develop. Do you want to stop here? Break? لا دكتور عادي خلينا نكمل. Okay. لأن أنا عندي حوالي 140 سلايد. Okay. ف we're not gonna go مرة واحدة. ف if you want me to stop now or when do you want to stop? After let's say after uh, optic neuritis we'll stop. دكتور أفضل.
Okay. Doctor, one question. Yeah. The arteritic or non-arteritic? Yeah. Mm. Again, if the buffer is between them. Uh, طبعا if you want if you the profile. Okay. يعني the non the arteritic is older patients, صح? يعني older معناته sixty, seventy and above. Okay. Uh, any mm -hmm. patient above the age of 60, you have to suspect giant cell arteritis. You have to ask about the history, right? In the history, you have to ask about the history and you have to do the appropriate test. Uh, but uh, sometimes even history does not help you. A patient does not have systemic, at least someone occult GCA, and a patient does not have uh, systemic findings such as polymyalgia rheumatica or, or muscle pains or uh, joint pain, they would have only ocular symptoms such as transient loss of vision, transient double vision. So it's, it's really clinical suspicion more than anything else because if you don't suspect it, then you're gonna miss it. And if you miss it, then it's, it's, a, it's a problem, right? It's a big deal. Uh, examination sometimes can help you. And again, uh, we said that the visual loss in GCA is, tends to be more profound, mm -hmm. more severe. The disc is swollen more, and sometimes it changes in the, in the exam itself. If you see infarcts in the retina, not just the optic nerve, but in the retina as well, then this is also uh, uh, indicating uh, GCA. And GCA can also present retinal, can also present as retinal artery occlusion. Yeah, and not just ischemic optic neuropathy, okay? So it's all about your uh, having a high index of suspicion. Okay, does that um, answer your question? Is that the disc ratio is when... Uh, uh, the the uh, is usually is normal for GCA, but for non-arthritic, the cup to disc ratio is uh, small. Disc at risk. Okay, I'll ask the doctor. Okay, so optic neuritis. This is something that you are uh, probably more familiar with. So uh, optic neuritis. Most patients with about eighty to ninety percent of patients with optic neuritis would have uh, pain with eye movement, and this is usually a dull sort of aching pain, it's not a severe pain. Um, so in order to make the diagnosis, you really need to uh, demonstrate that this patient has an RAPD. Unless it's bilateral, then you don't, the, you know, the RAPD is, is not necessary. Uh, this, I'm just gonna show you, this is an OCT. Have you all seen OCT or have you seen, have you, seen OCT printouts or you know what is OCT? So is OCT is just a way where you can image the retina and, and, and look at the retina layers and we can segment the retina and we're using light to do that much like ultrasound, right? So this is uh, OCT and optic neuritis. It's, uh, measuring the thickness of the retinal nerve fiber layer. So it's taking a scan around the optic disc and it's giving us the thickness profile. And as you can see here, the, the green is sort of normal, the yellow is uh, in their intermediate range and red is thin or atrophic. And here on the on this patient here on the left side, you can see that these this goes above normal, so that means there is edema, there is thickening of the nerve fiber layer. And in the later stages, we get optic atrophy. So it, it sort of goes here in the red, and there's these red areas indicating areas of atrophy of the nerve fiber layer. So this is basically what happens with uh, optic neuritis. And now it's becoming we, we have the ability to look at not just the nerve fiber layer, but also the ganglion cell layers, sorry, the ganglion cells themselves. 
So we look at the ganglion cells here and you can measure the density of the ganglion cells in the macula. And with the optic neuritis is that what you see is uh, death of the ganglion cells following the optic neuritis attack. And optic neuritis, any optic neuritis patient would warrant MRI of the brain. Um, so the typical optic neuritis, like the MS top, uh, optic neuritis is uh, uh, presents and it will recover in about four to six weeks. However, an atypical optic neuritis, because now we know optic neuritis is not just multiple sclerosis, there are other causes of optic neuritis. And uh, there are atypical uh, uh, signs or red flags that would tell you that this is probably not the usual MS type of optimizers. First of all, is the age. If the patient is really young or really old, the patient has severe loss of vision to, uh, let's say, no light perception. If it's bilateral in adults, if there's no improvement in, let's say, after six weeks or the patient's Vision is getting worse over time. Lack of pain is, is uh, extremely unusual in optic neuritis. Um, and if you examine the patient and you see uh, things like severe dyskedema, severe hemorrhages, uh, exudates, retinitis, these are atypical findings in optic neuritis because in optic neuritis, they usually the disc is normal because it's retrobulbar or there is mild disc swelling only. And of course, if the patient has recurrence, like once you give him steroids and then you stop the steroids, the patient re recurs or rebounds immediately. This is also a red flag. And if the patient has pre-existing systemic diagnosis, such as cancer or uh, vasculitis or are taking immunosuppressive treatment. So, uh, Right now, we know optic neuritis can be due to MS or it can be due to uh, NMO or MOG. And these are the diagnostic criteria for uh, uh, NMO spectrum disorders. So we have basically three, uh, 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 we, have, uh, we have to have one core clinical character characteristic and we have to have a positive test for aquaporin for IgG and you have to exclude alternative diagnosis. So the core clinical characteristic are uh, optic neuritis, could be myelitis, aria postrema syndrome, acute brainstem syndrome, and uh, symptomatic narcolepsy or acute diencephalic clinical syndrome. Or it could be a symptomatic cerebral syndrome. For us, ophthalmologists, we see patients with optic neuritis. So this is one core clinical characteristic. And when we see them, we tend, we check for aquaporin for IgG or NMO IgG antibodies. So NMO IgG is usually unilateral, but it can also be bilateral. It tends to affect females uh, more rapid and severe loss of vision than the MS type of optic neuritis. And the disc edema is, no, uh, is mild or normal. And interestingly, we've seen many patients who don't, don't even have pain with NMO optic neuritis, especially older patients with NMO. They, you, sometimes you don't, you don't have that pain in the history. Now, for you guys, because you're gonna do a lumbar puncture, you can see uh, additional findings that would support the diagnosis, such as uh, cells in the CSF, and the absence of oligoclonal bands would uh, more push the diagnosis more towards being an NMO than multiple sclerosis. And the imaging in NMO for the orbit, the enhancement of the optic nerve tends to be more diffuse and tends to be more posterior. So it would involve the posterior visual pathways and can involve the chiasm. And this is atypical for multiple sclerosis. Uh, this is also just showing you the enhancement along the uh, posterior visual pathway. Uh, this is the right intracranial optic nerve. And here you can see chiasmal uh, enhancements in NMO patients. 
and this is the uh, myelitis. Uh, other uh, neuroimaging findings uh, that you can see, you can see the, uh, the, trend, the long, uh, the LATM, long longitudinal extensive transverse myelitis. And this is also showing you enhancement and thickening of the uh, chiasm. And this is just showing you some additional uh, brainstem findings and brain uh, imaging findings in NMO. So, uh, the uh, anti acroporin 4 antibody has been discovered in 2004, but now we have the anti MOG as well, which is another unique subset. And uh, interestingly, uh, uh, patients who have one antibody, they don't have antibody of the other type. So if you have a MOG antibody, you would not have acroporin 4 antibody with it, so uh, NMO IgG with, with it. So that just tells you that the, there are, these are two distinct uh, entities. So um, how do you suspect MOG optic neuritis? MOG tend to be recurrent, tends to be bilateral, and you can get severe disc edema. And we said in NMO and uh, MS, you don't get severe disc edema. You can get disc hemorrhages also, which is atypical for optic neuritis, right? And the other thing about MOG optic neuritis is that it's very sensitive to steroids. So if, the, if you give, let's say a patient has optic neuritis and you give him steroids and you notice dramatic improvement in, in vision, let's say within one or two days of using steroid, then this is possibly indicating that this patient could have MOG optic neuritis. So this is uh, neuroimaging and the fundus finding for a patient with MOG optic neuritis. You can see the patient has bilateral disc edema. He's got some disc hemorrhages here. Uh, the other thing about MOG is that it will give you this type of appearance. You can have enhancement around the optic nerve, the optic nerve sheath. And this is called optic perineuritis. This is typical of, uh, has been seen more and more with MOG optic neuritis, and it's not seen with uh, MS type, type of optic neuritis or NMO. So just look at the, when you're looking at the uh, fat, sur fat saturated views of the orbit, look for this uh, optic perineuritis and, and MOG. Now, of course, MOG, uh, IgG, uh, uh, can be associated with encephalitis and myelitis as well, or acute disseminated encephalomyelitis. How would you treat MOG? Uh, overall, the, the, the prognosis is much better for uh, MOG anybody than NMO IgG. Uh, so we, we treat them with steroids, of course, and if they're not improving, uh, you can use uh, plasma exchange. And the earlier you give it, the better plasma exchange of the patient is not improving following steroids. And there are studies that uh, have shown that. And this is just the, um, it's just a typical, this is just an algorithm of how would you treat a MOG optic neuritis. So you, you give the patient steroids and the patient has, let's say, has uh, severe demyelination, has uh, encephalitis or encephalomitis, you might consider giving him PLEX or IVIGG uh, uh, acutely. The patient improves, if he has optic neuritis and improves, you can monitor him. And if you relapse, you can treat with uh, the acute episode, but you can also consider maintenance therapy, uh, which is either um, with Imuran or Celsept or uh, Rituximab, right? And um, if the patient relapses on treatment, uh, there are studies that show monthly IV, IG, um, immunoglobulin can help these patients. Uh, neuroretinitis is when you have uh, disc swelling along with exudates and the macula like that. So it's the nerve and the retina, neuroretinitis. And this is typically seen with uh, cat scratch disease. TB, syphilis, sarcoid, and uh, some other viral or parasitic agents such as toxoplasmosis. This is also a, a self uh, 
limited condition. Initially, when you see those patients, they may not have those exudates. In the first, let's say, one or two weeks, they can just have the uh, swelling of the disc. And sometimes when you see them two or three weeks later, you would uh, be surprised to see the formation of these uh, star-shaped exudates. So um, if this is a cat scratch disease, you would treat them with antibiotics. And uh, if you suspect another etiology, you have to uh, you know, investigate for syphilis, TB, or toxoplasmosis. Uh, Doctor, I have a question. Yes. Uh, the patient, يعني, يعني typical presentation of optic neuritis, uh, but maybe, يعني, can be suspicion of maybe infectious causes. Usually, infectious causes of optic neuritis, they should present with macular star, neuroretinitis. Um, يعني, يعني, I cannot say this patient is having infectious cause and he's having typical presentation of optic neuritis. صح ولا it can be? No, you are correct. And sometimes you need the, uh, the ophthalmologist to help you with that because uh, the patient has an infectious cause. He could have uveitis in association with the optic neuritis and he can, uh, so you need to, the patient needs slit lamp examination and sometimes you need to see if the patient has uveitis, has vitritis, has the anterior uveitis or posterior uveitis. And uh, that, by that way you rule out infectious causes, but so typical classical presentation, young patient, uh, mm. pain with eye movement, um, the eye looks quiet, you know, the patient is, looks healthy, there's nothing in the history, then you can presume that this patient has optic neuritis but if the patient is not improving uh, let's say then you're suspecting infection either based on your history on your exam then you probably need the uh, ophthalmologist to help you in order to examine this patient with the bio microscope and see if they can find any uh, other findings that would uh, support your suspicion okay tamam thank you thank you doctor So infiltrative optic neuropathy, this patient presented with disc swelling and uh, progressive loss of vision and she was treated with steroids with no improvement uh, and uh, the MRI showed enhancement of the optic nerve sheath along with the lesion here, sort of medial to the optic nerve, right? And in the, uh, the coronal views, you can see enhancement of the nerve here. So this patient had a biopsy of the optic nerve sheath and she, uh, she was found to have optic nerve lymphoma, which was just isolated to the optic nerve. So here just showing you that this is a, the atypical findings of this patient. This patient did not, is progressively getting worse. She's a bit old. She is not responding to treatment. And maybe in the examination, there were additional findings such as vitreous reaction or vitritis or posterior uveitis. The degree of the disc swelling just was uh, severe to call this optic neuritis. So this is just one example where you have to kind of be, be open-minded and look for other possibilities. And sometimes we, we have to go and biopsy the optic nerve sheath, just like we did in this patient to establish the diagnosis. Uh, radiation optic neuropathy is, uh, occurs when someone has uh, radiation for either a brain tumor or orbital tumor, and uh, they present, let's say, one or a year or uh, six months or a year or two years later with, uh, with optic neuropathy in that eye, and sometimes uh, retino retinopathy. And sometimes they look so bad that the, pay, that the uh, physician thinks that they have the tumor back or they've had the original condition back. But this is basically just radiation injury to the endothelial cells causing ischemia. Uh, you might see enhancement of the optic nerve when we do uh, an MRI for these patients. And this is one example of a radiation optic neuropathy. You can see that how much swelling 
there is with the hemorrhages and the retina here. So this is a radiation injury. So always ask about history of radiation. Uh, you don't see that much now with the, the stereotactic radiotherapy and, and the, the, the new techniques, but uh, you would sometimes see that, for example, in patients who've had brain tumors and have had radiation with a significant uh, amount of radiation, right? So um, radiation optic neuropathy, and this is another picture of the radiation optic neuropathy showing you disc swelling and exudates and the macula. And this basically looks like much like diabetic retinopathy or hypertensive uh, retinopathy because it's vascular. It's the same thing. It's, it's, the only difference here is that the vascular injury was sustained because of the radiation. But the, the changes that you, you would see, the disc edema, the hemorrhages, the exudates, they, can, they are nonspecific and can be seen in diabetic retinopathy and other conditions. Okay, so uh, labor hereditary optic neuropathy uh, is a condition that occur, that uh, presents with uh, uh, monocular and then sequential loss of vision. And uh, it tends to occur more in the second uh, sort of second, first, second decade, but it can, it has been reported between the age of six to 80. Uh, the, the, this is a mitochondrial optic neuropathy, so you would see that in men and, and boys, young boys. Uh, you know, the women are usually uh, asymptomatic carriers, but maybe 10 to 20% of women, sometimes they manifest the disease. And the presentation is usually one eye uh, being involved and then the other eye is involved in weeks or months later on. The visual field defect is usually central or sequocentral. And when you look at the nerve of these patients, you'd see this typical swelling and this sort of telangiectatic or micro telangiectatic vessels and this is one of those conditions that can sometimes be confused with optic neuritis and the patient may receive steroids and get neuroimaging uh, thinking that he has optic neuritis and this is the uh, later stage when there's optic atrophy in the eye so um, this is a mitochondrial disease and uh, there are four primary mitochondrial uh, mutations uh, the 11778 tends to be the one that is most uh, severe and has the worst uh, visual uh, prognosis, but the 1449 tends to be better in terms of prognosis, and sometimes patients can regain uh, a significant amount of vision. Um, uh, the other thing about this, this is a mitochondrial condition, so you have to rule out cardiac conduction defects on, the, on those patients. You need to do an EKG and have a cardiac evaluation for them. There is no good treatment for this. Uh, there are studies now using gene therapy uh, by uh, gene vector. Uh, there are also studies that show that uh, idibenone, idibenone, which is a, a coenzyme Q10 uh, type of uh, a supplement can help these patients maintain their vision and prevent uh, further progression of uh, vision. vision. Um, compressive optic neuropathy, whether it's due to thyroid disease or meningioma or pituitary tumors or gliomas, um, again, this patient can have a progressive course right and uh, the key for uh, diagnosis is using the imaging this is a patient with uh, thyroid uh, optic neuropathy and you can see here the muscles are enlarged and the eye is propped toast and uh, there's compression of the uh, optic nerve at the apex of the orbit and the patient losing vision uh, as a result of that so this patient would need uh, uh, either surgical decompression 
or IV steroids and sometimes uh, radiation treatment for this. So radiation, I'm not sure if you see many uh, thyroid patients, but um, uh, the compressive opteropathy can occur in thyroid eye disease patient. This is one example of a patient who presented with uh, significant amounts of uh, vision loss over the course of few weeks. And if you look at her, she doesn't look that much proptotic, maybe a bit more on the right side, but you can, um, uh, you can see much more worse, sort of much more proptosis in thyroid eye disease. When you do a CT scan, she has uh, crowding at the apex, she has enlargement of the extraocular muscles uh, and compression of the optic nerve. So we did decompression for her uh, endoscopically and through the orbit and her vision was back after decompression. So for thyroid optic neuropathy, thyroid uh, optic neuropathy, steroid radiation, orbital decompression, um, I don't know if you heard about the uh, Tepeza, the teprotumumab, which is a new insulin-like growth factor receptor inhibitor that has just been approved and is being used now to treat uh, thyroid eye disease. I'm not sure if it's still, it's probably still not available here in Kuwait, but it's coming. Optic nerve sheath meningiomas, uh, usually uh, middle-aged to older women, uh, progressive loss of vision, sometimes mild proptosis. And if you do MRI for this patient, you'd see the, uh, the uh, optic nerve sheath uh, changes or sometimes called the tram track appearance uh, with the uh, axial MRI views. And this is a diagnosis that is made based on imaging, right? Typical imaging findings and the, uh, the typical profile of the patient. And the, in the fundus, you would see optic atrophy, but sometimes you see those so-called optociliary uh, shunt vessels, right? And the treatment for this patient is uh, stereotactic radiotherapy. Uh, Other things that can give you uh, uh, compressive optic neuropathies are large aneurysm, and this is an aneurysm of the ophthalmic artery and it's shown here the large uh, signal void uh, void signal here as, as causing compressive optic neuropathy in one eye. This is another picture, it's probably not that clear. Orbital apex lymphoma or lymphomas or uh, metastatic tumors or secondary tumors can cause optic neuropathy as well. And as far as hereditary optic neuropathy, we talked a bit about labor, but there are other types of hereditary optic neuropathy, the most common one being dominant optic uh, uh, neuropathy or optic atrophy, but there are also recessive and X-linked. So dominant optic atrophy uh, presents with variable uh, visual acuity. It can, visual acuity can be normal, 20-20, and can be as bad as counting finger. The thing is about this thing, because it's a dominant condition, sometimes it's helpful to examine the family members because they could have the disease and they, they don't have much, they're not very symptomatic. The uh, mutation is uh, OPA1 gene mutation. And this is, if you look at the fundus, you'd see this temporal excavation of the uh, optic disc, and sometimes this is, this is uh, confused with notching that is seen in glaucoma. But uh, this is dominant optic atrophy, right? Another picture of dominant optic atrophy, you can see temporal pallor here on one side. Uh, optic atrophy with other neurological diseases such as uh, Wolfram syndrome, dead, dead moth syndrome, uh, the spinous cerebellar ataxias, uh, especially the hereditary uh, spinous cerebellar ataxias and Friedrich ataxia, um, can have uh, many of them can have optic atrophy associated with them. So you need to look for those as well. We talked uh, about labors. Toxic nutritional optic neuropathy is due to um, 
abuse of tobacco or alcohol or uh, vitamin or nutritional deficiency, just like we've said in uh, post-bariatric uh, surgery. So here, patient can present with, usually typically with binocular uh, loss of vision in one eye, and it tends to be progressive, and you need to stop the inciting agent, whether it's being tobacco or alcohol, and uh, give them thiamine and basically assess them for any vitamin, nutritional deficiency, and you need to supplement, replace, uh, replace that deficiency. Recovery is usually slow. We talked about labor, we're not gonna talk about labor. This is a patient with toxic optic neuropathy. And the thing about toxic optic neuropathy, much like labor, hereditary top optic neuropathy, that it involves the papillomacular bundle, which is the temporal portion of the disc here. And that's why it gives you the central scotoma here. This is the visual field. You can see the central scotoma here and here. Okay, so the papillomacular bundle is really susceptible, the most susceptible uh, fibers for uh, toxic injury. This is a 35-year-old woman who underwent uh, bariatric surgery for weight loss. Uh, she's been complaining of nausea and vomiting and significant weight, weight loss. She's not using alcohol and she presented with um, eye movement abnormalities, ptosis, confusion, ataxia. So she basically had Wernicke's uh, encephalopathy and she responded to IV thiamine. You can see that there is some pallor of the optic nerve and that there, there are so hemorrhages. So she probably had associated optic neuropathy along with that. This is someone who presented with, uh, um, uh, you know, following the ingestion of uh, locally made alcohol, which contains um, probably high percentage of methanol. And you can see uh, they presented with uh, loss of vision and disc swelling in both eyes. This is the left eye and just show you the, the disc swelling and the edema of the nerve fiber layer. And this patient ended up with uh, poor vision uh, following that. This is just uh, on the methanol. Okay. Is this on early changes or a, a these are, late these are, uh, stage? These are early changes. Yes. Yeah. Um, in late changes, okay. you would yeah, you would see optic uh, optic atrophy. But uh, yeah, these are the early changes. Um, Have you more optic picture? This is the disc swelling, you know. So this is he's the, he's got swelling and he's got edema. You can see this this edema of the nerve fiber layer. So it's not optic actually. No, oh, it's okay, not, okay. No, it's not. This is early. This is like days after the injury, so you wouldn't expect to see optic atrophy at that stage. Oh. Yeah, I've we've seen you know I've seen a lot of these cases recently. I think uh, even during the corona epidemic because there's not much access to alcohol so people are you know going around and and and, and buying this locally made uh, alcohol and uh, we've seen i've seen a lot of cases you know men women yeah, in the <laughs> so uh anyway uh the there are many drugs that can cause uh, optic neuropathy uh, the most important ones, as you know, are ethambutol, uh, amuderone, which is a commonly used antiarrhythmic drug. But there are other drugs as well, such as antibiotic and immunosuppressive uh, uh, treatment that are neurotoxic, and the list is, is quite long. You need to check, check them out. But uh, anybody who's using a, a, this is why drug history is really important. Anybody who's been who's using these drugs can experience optic neuropathy. Uh, we talked about paraneoplastic optic neuropathy and retinopathy. So paraneoplastic retinopathy is, again, you see that in small cell lung cancer, thyroid cancer, and thymoma. Uh, um, 
Sometimes you need the help of the ophthalmologist because you can see the, uh, you can have retinitis and vitrocellular reaction. And the CSF picture can be suggestive of inflammatory process. The CRMP5 IgG antibody is uh, one of those antibodies that you can check for if you're suspecting perineoplastic optic uh, neuropathy. Uh, this is just a case. I'm going to show you a case here. And this is a 54 year old man presented with decreased vision in the left eye for two months. He's seen an ophthalmologist who has told him that he has cataract in the left eye and he needs cataract surgery. Uh, past medical history is only positive for hypertension. Visual acuity is 20, 30, 20, 40. Uh, color vision showing reduced color vision on the left side. If this is the eye that he's complaining uh, of, and he has left RAPD. This is his visual field. Anybody wants to comment on the uh, visual field? Anybody? It looks like a junctional scotoma. Why did you say it's junctional? <laughs> uh, because the, there is um, affection almost of the whole eye on the left. Yeah. And uh, scotoma on the right. Uh, yeah, I mean, maybe if you see here, it's, it's on the top indication, it's not very clear, but, but yeah, it could be either monoc, you know, it could be unilateral, or it could be an early junctional scotoma, it's really hard to tell. So what, what do you expect the lesion to be? Is it uh, anterior to the chiasm, is it chiasm, or is it posterior to the chiasm? Uh, it will be in, in the bend in the crossing fiber anterior, almost anterior to the chiasm, chiasm. Yeah, okay. There so, is a place, I forgot the name. <laughs> this is the imaging of that patient. So, uh, there is a space occupying lesion. Mm -hmm. Um, it looks, and it's a big uh, lesion. It looks anterior chiasmal. Uh, it's not that obvious, where, but where it looks the, chiasmal. Which structure is uh, you think it's involved? What is the structure, Yanni? What is the lesion? Pituitary. Pituitary. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's quite huge. If you think the, the, that the yeah, small field defect is only in eyes, right? And he's got this, and you can see that there are mixed signal here. This probably indicates hemorrhages or sort of pituitary apoplexy. And, and he probably had uh, growth and some hemorrhages inside the tumor. So this is a large lesion. So this is just to show you sometimes how you can get uh, discordance between the MRI findings and the visual, because you really expect uh, you know, more is probably more severe uh, visual loss or visual field defect with this kind of picture, but you don't get that always. So this patient, yeah, has a pituitary macroadenoma, and uh, I think he was, uh, he started taking medical treatment and it shrank after medical uh, treatment. He did not need uh, surgery. Okay. Okay, so I'm just gonna gonna talk, continue talking where we left about chiasmal disorders. We chiasmal disorders respect the vertical meridian, and you know when you when you see a visual field test, always check if the field is respecting the vertical or the horizontal meridian. Anything that's respecting the vertical meridian is either chiasmal or retrochiasmal. Uh, anything that's respecting the vertical meridian is, is, is sort of the horizontal meridian is optic nerve. So the most common field defect you would see with 
uh, chiasmal disorders is bitemporal hemianopsia, but you can also see uh, junctional uh, scotomas, as we have seen in the previous case. This is an example of a right junctional scotoma. So here you have right uh, central loss of vision, and you have a superior temporal uh, defect on the left side, and the, the, the cause, uh, this is again uh, the schematic representation. This is where the junctional scotoma is, and the reason you get a junctional scotoma because you are uh, getting the ipsilateral optic nerve fibers, and you are getting the, uh, the you are getting the uh, inferonasal fibers on the other side, which are uh, giving you the supertemporal visual field defect. So, so this is called the uh, von Willebrand's knee. Basically, as the fibers go to cross on the chiasm on the other side, they are making a knee kind of loop, right? And uh, these are usually the infernasal, these are the infernasal fibers. So when there is a compressive lesion here, that is pressing on the ipsilateral optic nerve fibers and the Myers loop will give you a central field defect on one eye and a supertemporal defect on the other eye. Okay, uh, unilateral temporal hemianopsia is actually very rare, and this is the original uh, junctional scotoma. It's called trachear scotoma. When junctional scotoma was first described it was uh, intended to denote this type of visual field defect. It's a unilateral temporal scotoma, but this is actually very rare. And the most common field defect we see is the uh, bitemporal visual field defect. So this is another example of a chiasmal syndrome. And you can see here a pituitary tumor right? And this is a junctional scotoma. You can see a central visual field defect on the left and a supertemporal defect on the right side. This band atrophy is when you have a chiasma lesion and the, the lesion is compressing only the crossing nasal fibers. So these are the papillomacular bundle fibers along with the nasal fibers nasal retinal fibers, and it would give you the uh, shape of a, a, a band or a, what's so-called a, a bow tie type of, of uh, atrophy, shaped like a bow tie. So uh, chiasmal syndrome can be caused by extrinsic, extrinsic causes, most commonly tumors. So these are two pituitary tumors, uh, craniopharyngiomas, meningiomas, aneurysm, and dilated third ventricle. And many of those patients would undergo uh, surgery, right? Either by, uh, or uh, radiation, right? So sometimes they would experience delayed visual loss following treatment. So this of course can be due to tumor recurrence, but if the patient has had uh, uh, radiation, then you would need to rule out radionecrosis, as we've described for radiation optic neuropathy or, or retinopathy. And sometimes uh, what happens is that when the, the tumor is decompressed, the chiasmal just descends and becomes distorted, and adhesions develop around the chiasm, and this can cause traction and uh, visual, visual uh, problems. Uh, Many times, surgeon, neurosurgeons, when they decompress these uh, pituitary tumors, they would pack this area, cellar area, with fat. And this fat can expand uh, postoperatively and can compress on the chiasm, and that can cause uh, also postoperative visual loss. As far as intrinsic causes of chiasmal disorders, uh, tuberculosis, inflammation. Remember NMO, we said NMO uh, uh, can present as a chiasma, uh, chiasmal neuritis or chiasmal syndrome. Uh, 
IgG for related uh, IgG for, for related disorder, tumors and uh, metastatic, whether primary or metastatic, and trauma. This is a patient with uh, sarcoidosis, and you can see that the diencephalic or the, hyp or the hypothalamus and the diencephalic area is involved, and this is uh, common in sarcoidosis. It tends to involve sort of the base of the skull and the base of the brain, but this patient also has uh, involvement of the uh, cellar area and the chiasm. This is a patient with IgG4-related disease, and he presented with uh, bilateral uh, optic neuritis or optic neuropathy, and here you can see enhancement and enlargement of the right optic nerve and the uh, left optic nerve as well. And this patient had a biopsy of his uh, the sinuses that confirmed the diagnosis of IgG4-related uh, disease. As far as retrochiasmal lesion, we said that uh, anything that's posterior to the chiasm is homonymous. And uh, so optic tract lesion uh, can be due to aneurysm, inflammation, or demyelination, or ischemia. This is just showing you what happens if you have an optic tract lesion. You can get also a bow tie uh, atrophy a uh, particular pattern of bow tie atrophy because your the optic tract contains both crossing and non-crossing fibers. So the crossing fibers, which are the papillomacular bundle and the nasal fibers, will give you sort of a horizontal bow tie, and the uh, non-crossing temporal fibers will give you like a sort of like a vertical bow tie, and you can see that here somewhat, probably not that clearly in the picture. Lateral geniculate lesion uh, tends to present as a, as a sector, sectoranopia, so it's a sector, and uh, the lateral geniculate nu uh, nucleus is supplied by the posterior lateral choroidal artery, which is a branch of the posterior cerebral artery, and this is our example of lateral geniculate lesions and the visual field defect that corresponds with it. So if you have a lateral posterior choroidal artery occlusion, that tends to involve the central area of the visual field defect because it's involving the hilum, central part of the lateral geniculate, whereas the anterior choroidal artery occlusion tends to involve, uh, tends to spare the central area. Uh, temporal lobe lesion, this is just uh, showing you the Myers loop. So as the uh, optic, as the visual pathways come from the lateral geniculate body, they form a loop the temp, uh, in the temporal lobe, the Myers loop, and the parietal lobe as they go to the occipital cortex. And with the temporal uh, lobe lesion, you get pie in the sky. So you get... Uh, uh, a superior hem homonymous hemianopsia, and it's you can see that sort of here. This patient has a, a visual field defect here on the left, on the right, on the same side. So this patient has a right homonymous hemianopsia due to a temporal lobe lesion. A parietal lesion will give you pi on the floor, and with a parietal lesion, you can have. Of course, you can have associated uh, neurological signs that would uh, point to a parietal lobe lesion, such as, such as hemiplegia, hemisensory loss, or neglect. Uh, Gersman syndrome uh, occurs in the dominant lobe, which is acalculia, agraphia, finger agnosia, and left-right confusion as well. And the lesion in the non-dominant parietal lobe will give you uh, contralateral neglect. Uh, the occipital lobe is uh, an area where there is a high representation of the uh, macular fibers, right? So you can see almost 70% of the occipital lobe area is uh, devoted to the central macular fibers. And you can get, and the only area where there is uh, 
there is monocular presentation in the occipital cortex is this temporal crescent, which is the anterior most part here of the occipital uh, cortex. So occipital lobe lesions will give you a congruous homonymous hemianopsia, possibly sparing fixation. And it's very uncommonly that you would get a monocular defect uh, uh, of an, uh, due to an occipital lesion because of involvement of the temporal crescent, because it's very unusual that you would see a lesion only affecting this anterior portion and sparing the rest of the occipital cortex. So occipital lobe lesions, most common uh, lesion that we see is strokes. And uh, if there is bilateral occipital lobe damage, then this would give you a cortical blindness. And this can be due to stroke or uh, severe blood loss, eclampsia, hypertension, uh, carbon monoxide poisoning, and uh, cyclosporin. So, uh, Sometimes we get a uh, higher cortical visual dysfunction and that the patient can, uh, due to involvement of various visual association areas of the cortex. So once the visual pathways goes to the uh, occipital cortex, then they, they project to different secondary visual association area in the parietal and the temporal lobe, right? And this would give you a varietal of uh, higher cortical visual dysfunction is that, that the patient may be able to see, but he's not able to process or interpret what he is seeing. And this is, uh, can be presented in a variety of syndrome. So to think of these uh, dysfunction, you have to think of uh, the fibers as they go from the occipital cortex to the parietal lobe and to the temporal lobe. So we have the Watts pathway, which is a continuation of the uh, parvocellular pathway from the lateral geniculate nucleus. And this is basically the occipital temporal pathway. So this is the pathway from the occipital cortex to the uh, temporal lobe. And it's mostly concerned with object recognition, color, shape, and, and pattern. And the kind of um, the higher cortical dysfunction syndrome that you would see with the what pathway is things like alexia, anomia, agnosia, and amnesia. Whereas the occipital parietal pathway is the wear pathway, right? And it's more, more concerned with spatial orientation and visual guidance of movement. And it's continuation of the uh, magnocellular pathway of the lateral geniculate nucleus. So the kind of visual uh, dysfunction that you would see with this is things like simultagnosia, optic ataxia, acquired oculomotor apraxia, and hemispatial neglect. neglect. Cortical blindness is, as we said, is when you have bilateral occipital lobe damage. And um, if you're not careful, sometimes this can be misdiagnosed as functional loss of vision. And this can occur with stroke, severe blood loss, hypertension, uh, carbon monoxide poisoning, and cyclosporin. This is one interesting syndrome that you could uh, sometimes see if you have loss, uh, the patient has loss of ability to read, but he can write alexia without agraphia. And it's due to left occipital lobe infarct, usually and involvement of the splenium of the uh, corpus callosum. So we have in the left temporal lobe, the, the, the left angular gyrus here, this is the uh, language processing area, which is the area responsible for processing visual information and reading. So because the temporal lobe, the ipsilateral temporal lobe here is, an, uh, is damaged, and visual information cannot travel from here to there. And because we have the splenium of the corpus callosum involved as well, even visual information from the intact occipital lobe cannot travel to that area to be processed and the patient is not able to read. So this is alexia without agraphia. Uh, 
And lastly, uh, you're going to have patients who, who will come to you and they would uh, uh, they would give you a history and you won't say you, you will not be able to find any uh, anything in the examination. And these are the functional patients. These are the patients that you didn't, can't find an organic cause for their complaint. And sometimes, many of the time, the uh, demonstrated behavior that is incompatible really with the uh, alleged level of visual loss that they have. Now, many of those patients would have um, sort of psychological uh, stressor events that would precede that loss of vision. And there are different ways that you can do to, um, to demonstrate that they are able to see uh, better than what they allege, right? So you can do things like compare the distance and the near visual acuity, and ideally these should be compatible, right? There are other things that you can do, uh, such as the vertical prism dissociation test. So this is, if the patient has, let's say, complaints of loss of vision in one eye, you would put a 10 or 15 prism diopter vertically in one eye, and if this patient uh, tells you, and you can put it on the, uh, you know, on the intact eye, right? So, or, so he doesn't, you don't arise, you don't raise the suspicion of the, the patient. And if the patient tells you that he sees two distinct similar images, that means he's able to see out of both eyes because the person is dissociating the images, right? So that means this is functional, but if he sees one blur image and one clear image, that that means that the visual uh, loss is genuine and it's not functional. And for, as far as binocular uh, functional loss of vision, and this is more difficult usually to prove that the patient is able to see better when than he claims to see better. Things like stereoacuity tests, which are tests that we use for a clinic, especially for uh, pediatric patients and patients who have strabismus, that will test the binocularity of the eye and sort of 3D and depth perception. And if the patient has good stereoacuity uh, with this test, uh, that means this patient probably has functional loss of vision and not a true loss of vision. Now, of course, you may need to do other tests such as uh, imaging and ERG or VEP or many other tests to prove uh, that they have functional loss of vision is the main thing is that you should not really sort of dismiss those patients immediately and say, oh, if you have functional loss of vision, go and just don't come back. You need just to follow them. And sometimes you have to reassure them and tell them that this is just going to get better. And many times it does get better over time with the uh, resolution of the stressor or the event that caused this uh, functional loss of vision. So uh, this is the end, I think, uh, long lecture, but if you have any question about anything that I've said, you can uh, ask me now.